Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. We keep hearing that the economy is improving, jobs are being created, and our overall outlook should be positive. Gas prices are low and the stock markets are at or near record highs. But whenever I go out into the real world, I see enormous numbers of people who are struggling. In New York City, 60,000 people are crammed into the homeless shelters every night. 25,000 of them are children. Similar evidence of working families in serious trouble can be found across the country. So what's the real story? Are we in boom times or tough times? What's really happening with working people? We'll talk about this with my guest, Rachel Swarns, who writes a compelling and important column at the New York Times called The Working Life. She's also the author of American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama. Rachel, welcome. Thanks for Thanks having Thanks for coming you. by. So um, half of New York City's 8 million residents are either poor, according to the official federal government definition, or very close to poor. So let's start with that general question. Are we in boom times or tough times? You know, we're something, someplace in the middle. We're in uh, what I like to describe as a very unsettled recovery period. Jobs are being created. Um, things are getting better. But the truth is that for most people in the city and in the country, people are worse off than they were um, before the recession, before the Great Recession. Right. So, so everything that... In terms that, of income, yeah. E exactly. So they haven't made up... We have not made up that gap yet. So um, jobs are, in fact, being created. Do you have a sense of what kind of jobs they are? For a long time, most of the jobs being created were low-wage, dead-end type jobs. Um, is that changing? Well, you're exactly right. Um, in this recovery period, um, a sizable chunk, um, some say almost as much as half, have been in restaurants, um, hotels, a very, um, you know, low wage, um, people are struggling to get enough hours to work in retail. Um, that's what we've been seeing. Um, and again, wages have not um, moved in the way that people have hoped they would. Now, in, toward the end of 2014 and looking forward, people are more hopeful. Economists are more hopeful. Um, and, you know, I'm certainly hopeful that we'll see a change. <laughs> Um, there was a report out recently suggesting that, you know, we're going to be seeing uh, some growth in middle income jobs. And certainly the city has seen an increase in the tech sector, which, you know, does pay well. So, you know, it remains to be seen, but I think people are feeling somewhat optimistic now. So when you say um, uh, people are feeling hopeful, the hope is that some of the jobs or more of the jobs that being created more. will be better jobs. That's right. And that wages will begin to rise. That's exactly right. I mean, one of the issues that we've seen, as I mentioned, wages have not uh, increased to the uh, pre-recession period. Also, you know, the number of hours. I mean, that's a real struggle for people still to be getting. You might have a, a job, um, but, you know, are you working the number of hours a week that's going to make it work for you and your family? And that remains an issue for families. Now, you had a column last fall that got a very big response. I think the woman's name was Maria Fernandez. That's right. Can you tell us about that column? Maria Fernandez was a uh, woman who lived in New Jersey, um, originally from Portugal, who was working at three Dunkin' Donuts uh, to make ends meet. And it was so uh, challenging, you know, getting from one shift to another shift, you know, morning, afternoon, overnight, that she often slept in her car. And, um, and she often left the car <laughs> running. And um, on one day, she did that, and she died in her car of, um, you know, carbon monoxide poisoning. So here's a case of a, of a woman where you talk about jobs being created. So she had three jobs. She had three jobs. But she wasn't she making a very hard, good living, yeah. even with three jobs. Even with three jobs, she was really struggling. She and then really she struggling. didn't have any reasonable, uh, obviously it's incredibly tragic that she died, but she didn't have any reasonable kind of life 
um, anyhow, uh, working three jobs, bouncing from one to another, never getting enough sleep and that sort of thing. That's right. And she had, you know, like uh, many working people who are struggling out there, she had dreams, m many dreams of a different kind of life. And she was trying, um, you know, her best to get herself there. That car in and of itself, which killed her, was an accomplishment. For a while, she was trying to manage this on public transportation. This car was a blessing. Um, and her landlady said she would often see her even sometimes she would park outside um, her little basement apartment uh, in, a, in a house in, in Newark um, and didn't even have the time to kind of walk inside, you know, to sleep on the couch. She sleep in the car and, and start again. So I didn't realize it. So for a while she was taking public transportation. So she had three jobs, three different and locations. She, it was an enormous struggle, <laughs> you know, wow. trying to do that on public transportation. But I think it really struck a chord with people because, you know, there is, you know, I think people, um, you hear the news um, and you hear the reports and the economy is getting better and the economy is getting better. At the same time, if you look at polls, Americans don't feel that. They really don't. And um, and people are worried about themselves and their prospects. People are, um, you know, trying to get by with less, and they worry about the future. Where, where are we going? One of the reasons, uh, probably, that they don't feel like things are as rosy as some of the statistics might indicate um, is that the monthly jobless statistics are often very deceptive. They give us a skewed picture of what's going on. So there's still an awful lot of people who are unemployed. That's right. And then you've been talking about the people who are underemployed. Uh, but all of these folks are not necessarily counted. You just get, a, you know, a, a big number. X That's number right. of jobs are created or the unemployment rate for this month is right. such, and, such and such. That's right. We've even actually, we, we did some interesting reporting at the Times toward the end of last year about just the number of people dropping out altogether because they, they can't make it, uh, they, disabilities or struggles. I mean, the, the labor participation rate in the country is, is down, and particularly among men who are struggling. Right. You know? So, and, and these folks are not, can they're, and they're not, they're, not they're, 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 they're not, they're not counted, they're not working, they're, they're, they're not out counted there. as unemployed. That's right. One of the things that has always struck me living here in New York is, how do low-wage workers make it in the metropolitan area, and especially in New York City, where everything is so expensive? So you're dealing with low to moderate um, income folks all the time. What are their lives like? Give us a, kind of a portrait of those lives in New York City. You know, I think about, um, you know, the restaurant worker who I profiled in December who was working, I think it was 25 to 30 hours a week, going back and forth from the Bronx, thinking about the holidays and his children and wondering what in the world he was going to do. You know, his daughter had given him a list and he knew there was no way that he could do that. I mean, he was struggling to pay the rent. People are living in, um, you know, the question of affordable housing in the city right. is a real um, challenge. People are really struggling day to day. And I, you know, I was born and raised in the city. I was born in Queens and I grew up in Staten Island and I live in New Jersey now. You know, it's, it's hard, I think, uh, for people, um, you know. It's tough. When you think about the things you need, uh, affordable housing, uh, good schools, a neighborhood without crime, um, reasonable commutes, it's not, it, it's a, it's, it's not easy. You mentioned affordable housing and, and I had, um um, use the, the statistic 60,000 people in the homeless shelters um, every night. But that really understates the problem because it doesn't talk about all the people who are doubled up. They're That's living right. with friends, they're living with families, and, and, right. and, and, and that sort of or thing. Or the incredible demand we've written recently about just the lotteries for um, affordable housing or just to get a spot in public housing. I know that a lot of people think, oh my goodness, public housing has such a terrible reputation in New York. It is sought after. It's essential. It's, you know, it is, and there's just not enough. Right. The, um, in one of your columns, you asked whether um, Mayor de Blasio had um, sort of uh, delivered on his promise to improve the lives of struggling families um, in, in this city. He had uh, talked about a tale of two cities and that sort of thing. And you came to some conclusions in your column. Can you talk about that? You know, he um, came um, to office uh, promising to change the dynamic and to really champion um, struggling New Yorkers. And I think, 
you know, there's only so much that a mayor can do. Um, he's got the economy to deal with. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's not easy. But I think if you look at his first year, you know, I, I think that he made a difference. Uh, he passed paid sick leave. Um, and, you know, for a lot of professionals, um, paid sick leave, we all have paid sick leave. What does that mean? It means an enormous amount to people. Yeah, if you have it, you take it for granted. <laughs> That's right. If you don't, <laughs> if you've got a sick kid, people lose their jobs. Yep. That is a big deal. Um, you know, universal pre-K, again, um, you know, that's an education initiative, but it also supports families who really struggle to find good quality um, education and programs for, for young children. Um, think about the living wage and increasing the living, living wage and expanding the living wage. Um, I think that he, um, I mean, I think there were some um, advocates who would say he hasn't done as much as people have hoped for. I mean, he certainly faced tailwinds from Albany. He wanted to get <laughs> <laughs> New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is. He wanted New York City to, to have the authority to raise its own minimum wage. It's still a goal that he has. It looks like it's not happening. Yeah, because of what's happened with the legislature. That's right. Yeah. And even even without that, you know, uh, you know, I, the Senate probably... Uh, uh, in Republican hands wasn't going to go for right. that. So I, I think that, um, you know, he's made steps forward. And I think that um, these are tangible steps for people. Now, he also wants to um, sort of, I think, pretty radically change the workfare um, That's program. Right. Uh, and, and this has been on the books for years. That's it was right. A pet of Rudy Giuliani. That's right. Um, can you explain what workfare is and how has it fared That's right. since it's been effective? Right, so Workfare, um, which, you know, I wrote about when Giuliani was mayor back in the 90s, was a program where people were required to work for their welfare benefits. Um, you know, it came at a time when there was a lot of concern, both at the federal level and state and local levels, about welfare and um, folks who were perhaps abusing uh, welfare or cash assistance. So New York City created the largest workfare program in the country, uh, close to 30,000 odd people who were um, sweeping streets, um, you know, cleaning, um, things like that, some office work, but mostly, um, you know, kind of uh, maintenance type work. And um, over the years, and you know, even um, under Bloomberg, it started shrinking. Even under Giuliani, it started shrinking because <laughs> the truth is it was expensive and also, you know, it was unclear kind of what the results were. Advocates complained that, you know, people, what were they really getting out of this? Um, if you talk to people who were involved in the program, they said, you know, I'm, I'm so busy doing this, I can't even find a job, you know, that might actually take me out of this. Um, and last year, um, uh, Mayor de Blasio said, you know, we're going to end this. And not only are we going to end this workfare program, but we're going to reorient our priorities um, for folks on cash assistance. We're going to emphasize education. We're going to emphasize short-term training programs that are, you know, targeted toward um, places where wages are higher and um, uh, that, you know, people can make a better living. Now, the truth is, it's a bit controversial in the sense that, you know, there are folks who have studied this who say, oh, my gosh, there's a long history of training programs that simply don't work. Um, so you might be replacing workfare. Right, with, with, with something that doesn't actually do much for people. But, you know, there is some research that suggests that the right kind of program that pairs um, education with job search and short-term um, programs can make a difference. And I think, you know, that's sort of clearly what de Blasio wants to try. So who can actually get welfare or the equivalent of welfare now? Because it was my understanding that that had uh, pretty much shrunk tremendously. Right. I mean, it's time limited. Um, so it's certainly not as easy as it was. But, you know, there's still a sizable number of people who that is the option. That's And then it still is a safety net for right. New Yorkers. You commented that among the many problems facing um, lower wage working people, it's, it's, it's not just the wages that they have to work for, that there are um, other problems. There's uncertainty about their hours. They right. don't know. Um, they don't even. schedules. Yeah, very often. They, they right. don't know what schedule they're, they're going to be uh, working. 
Um, you wrote about, uh, I think, a pregnant woman. Did, did she lose her job because... Right. You know, New York City um, a passed legislation that bars uh, employers from firing, you know, pregnant women and requires them to fire um, reasonable accommodations uh, for women who are pregnant. But, um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I wrote about two people last year who lost jobs um, because they were pregnant. In and one case, the, the, the woman's doctor said she couldn't work overtime. That's right. And her boss insisted that she work overtime, and then that job was That's right. just gone. That's right. And then a lot of people, uh, I think a surprising number, although I don't have the exact numbers, a, a, a lot of people are cheated out of their wages. They're not paid the wages they're supposed to be paid. How does that work? Well, you know, there's a minimum wage. Uh, for people in restaurants, there's a lower wage. It's a tipped minimum wage because the idea being that people will earn tips to supplement that. But, you know, for people who are um, undocumented, uh, people who are, um, you know, just struggling and on the margins, sometimes, and vulnerable, sometimes employers simply don't pay. They don't pay them overtime. They don't pay them the, the correct <laughs> amount, minimum, the minimum right. wage, and so you know, the less than the they will pay wage. them less than the minimum wage. And the challenge that the Department of Labor has had is that, you know, enforcement and ha having enough budget and staff to enforce um, the law has been difficult. You know, and so there are a lot of claims that you know people make. You know, sending them up to the Department of Labor in in Albany, saying, hey, you know, I I wasn't um, paid. And there are judgments made, but you know, to go after that employer and to get that money, sometimes employers close, right. open up under a new name in a different place. It's it's a real struggle for and people. It, it's hard for workers to fight to fight back. It's very if you, difficult. It, you know, one, because you're one, afraid you, you're going to lose your. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> lose because your job. you've got the. It's hard to find a job, so you want to make sure you hold on to the one, even. You know, even if you're not being paid, for it. and right. this has been true, they've had issues with the sick leave too, the paid sick leave, where people, you know, aren't getting the sick days they should, and you know, this question of, you know, do I challenge, do I not, and and what's the risk? It's, you know. Now, one group that has been fighting back though are, is there. There's been a group of low wage workers, uh, some in the in the uh, restaurant industry and in retail, who and, and in retail mm -hmm. who have been um, uh, protesting. There have been wildcat right. strikes and and that sort of thing. Now right. it's been very cold out lately. Right. <laughs> so, in the spring, spring is coming. We might see more. Um, well, you know the truth. But how's is, that fair? You know, I think it is making a difference. I mean, it's certainly making a difference in the conversation, and I think that's important. You know, you saw um, in the last round of elections um, nationally a number of um, you know localities increasing the minimum wage, mm -hmm. and I think that's because uh, workers, fast food workers, retail workers, have gone out there and made their stories known that you know we are just not making it on on these on um, you know on on these wages, and I think that opinion polls show that. I think Americans who feel overall, who feel uncertain, feel about their pro economic prospects, um, that resonates with them. And I think these workers are very courageous because it is, they absolutely can lose their jobs right. for protesting, and some have lost and some, their, have. some have lost their jobs. Yeah. So how did um, this column, the working life, come to be at the, at the New York Times? Because I have always thought that working people, working families poor people, low-income people, um, get short shrift in mainstream media. But you are not giving them short shrift. So how did this happen? You know, I've always um, wanted to write a column. One of, In particular, I've always wanted to write one of the columns for the New York pages, the Metro pages of the New York Times. Like I said, I was born in Queens. I grew up in Staten Island. I grew up reading um, the Metro columns. And I've done a lot in my career, but that's always a, been a dream. And, crazily enough or you know <laughs> they they came to me and said hey you know uh a year ago uh what about writing a column uh you know for the new york pages think about what you'd like to write about and um, so they didn't come with no, the topic no, already in hand no they said what what would be something a theme that you think might um appeal to you and appeal to readers and i thought about this um you know because work um it's 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 a way to write about almost anything in I New agree. York City. Um, you know, I've written about how people, uh, how marriages and are affected, about how siblings wrestle 
with you know their you know different um, situations and um, at the time, I had no idea that um, de Blasio was, he wasn't even thought of uh, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a front runner. Right, that um, was a weird election. It, it, it you was, nobody, you almost didn't I, see it, him it, coming, it right? It was something. So uh, <laughs> I think, you know, they agreed, and then all of a sudden it became very clear that this whole uh, concern about, um, you know, the prospects of ordinary New Yorkers was a, a, a real deep uh, concern among voters, um, the timing seemed to be just right. But but in fairness, in New York Times, they agreed before, without even knowing that. Wow, it seemed like it would great. resonate. Yeah. So, so the subject matter or, 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 of the column was your idea. That's right. That's great. So how do you go about, um, people always like to ask this question, how do you go about um, finding your columns, finding the subjects, it, uh, your, your um, you do it in what I think is the proper way. Everything or almost everything is on the record. People are identified. Right. How do you go about this? Um, you know, sometimes I've got my own ideas. I mean, I, I came into the column wanting to write about this unsettled recovery and how people were managing. And so that was kind of a theme I've um, been interested in following. Um, and then, you know, I people write to me on Twitter. Uh, they email <laughs> me. Um, you know, it is sometimes a challenge, and I, I'm, I'm very respectful and grateful to people who are, are willing to share their stories, uh, their photos, and, and their struggles. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Are there some things that have surprised you since you started the column? You know, I think the hardest thing um, for me, having been a journalist for 20 years um, or so more, uh, 20 years at the Times anyway, um, has been, um, you know, sharing a bit of myself uh, in, in the column and using uh, the I word, which for news journalists we, we, we don't really do. Um, but you know, uh, I've got firefighters who um, in my family, um, I, I, I talk about just my own work experiences. Um, and um, that, that, I don't do it much because I think the stories of New Yorkers are more interesting, but as a columnist uh, saying what I think uh, sometimes is something I'm still getting used to. You wrote, and we're running out of time, so we have to be uh, pretty brief mm -hmm. here, but you wrote a very moving column talking about the anxiety that a lot of African American parents face about right. potential encounters with the police. Talk That's about right. that and, and what prompted you to, to, to write that column and what prompted you to write it the way that you wrote it. You know, it was the Eric Garner uh, grand jury decision, and actually I was writing another column. But that day I came back and I was sitting at my desk, and I had had this conversation actually with my son who was seven, who asked about Ferguson. And I was sitting at my desk and I thought, you know, how many people here are worried about how do you talk to your kids about this? I think sometimes that um, people don't, know um, what a challenge uh, this is for African-American parents and how this weighs on us, particularly if we are the parents of black boys. People have a genuine fear that they might lose their children. You know, the mayor was criticized for talking about his son and his own concerns and, the, you know, the police unions were very concerned about that. How should you, you know, why should you say you're afraid of the police? But Perhaps it was um, uh, indelicate, or but it's true. It's it's how we feel. It's it's and it's it's palpable. Right. Uh, we've run out of time. Um, I wish we had more. Rachel Swarns, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. File this under really creepy technology. Deeply buried in the fine print for some customers buying Samsung's smart TV is this privacy policy tidbit. Please be aware that if your spoken words include personal or other sensitive information, that information will be among the data captured and transmitted to a third party through your use of voice recognition. My experience is that most of us do most of our deeply personal talking, our most important discussions, in the privacy of our homes, 
where our TVs tend to be. The idea that one or more of those TVs may be listening, recording, and transmitting our conversations is weird. The truth is that many of our devices with voice recognition features are operating when we don't realize it. They may be smartphones or voice recognition systems in our cars, whatever. They are capable of listening in on and transmitting spoken information that we had absolutely no intention of sharing. This may or may not be that big a deal at the moment, but as our devices become smarter and smarter, the invasion by strangers of our most personal spaces will become easier and easier. Privacy is going by the boards big time. It's something all of us need to keep in mind. That's all for now. See you next time.